today, I am watching Peg. Yeah, go Peg. Hi guys, Dane here, and today I'm going to be doing a quick review of Stanley McCloud Must Die by Adrian Baldwin. And I'm also going to be picking out the book for, for March for Todd and Dane's Indie Read Along. I'm going to make this a thing every time I have to say that I'm going to do that little jingle now. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to read the blurb, then I'm going to go through my notes and talk to you about this book. And then at the end of the video, I'm literally going to flip a coin to determine what the next book is. However, if you get bored and you don't want to watch the whole review, just check the description and uh, my book will be there. And I'll also link to Todd. So Todd is doing the same thing. He's also going to pick the book out of a jar. So... Um, I have no idea what Todd's March book is going to be, so you're just going to have to look below and check out his video or the description to see what that is. Alright, Danny McLeod Must Die by Adrian Baldwin. So, death can be a real downer. Just ask Stanley McLeod. The ancient and inveterate gambler has just found out he hasn't got long to live. Refusing to believe his prognosis, though, Stan puts a massive bet on that he will reach his next birthday. Surely his run of bad luck can't last. Unfortunately for Stan, the independent Bucky he uses grows nervous as the big day approaches and decides to bump him off with one of her many fun, but ever so slightly fatal, high odds proposition bets, aka Maggie specials. Will Stanley McLeod make it, ruining Maggie McCulloch in the process, or will the heartless Bucky have her evil way, accidentally kill him and save her business? Perhaps Stan's womanising alcoholic old pal, Dougie, can be of some help. Yeah right, good luck with that. Oh, and there's a whole secondary storyline about the head honcho, a serial killer who leaves his victims' torsos in one place and their heads in another. Yikes. A second dark comedy for grown-ups from award-winning Adrian Baldwin, this one's set among the tower blocks of Salford, Manchester, at the height of the banking crisis and global financial meltdown. I should mention, I first came across Adrian because a blogger friend of mine did a secret Santa, and Adrian got me as his person or whatever, and so he sent me his first book, which is called Barnacle Brat, and I highly enjoyed it, so I thought I'd grab this one. And also, I happen to know that there's a character in this called Dane Cobain who gets killed off by the head honcho, so I wanted to find out what happened. Before we get started, one thing I would mention is this is very much dark comedy. Like, this has trigger warnings for everything, like, you name it, drug use, rape, sexual assault. It is dark. However, it was also quite funny as well. Possibly not politically correct at all times, but eh. It's also, it reminded me a lot of um, Irvin Welsh. It's definitely got Irvin Welsh vibes, and I don't know if that's just because Dougie in this is a Scotsman, and his dialect is written out in Scottish dialect. Yeah, to give you an idea of who what this character is like, so this is Dougie the Scotsman. Dougie locks his lips and throws away the key. He then jeers a blonde on a bicycle. Cat calls a woman walking a dog. Wolf whistles a female jogger and almost gets into a fight with a long-haired backpacker who turns out to be a bloke. All this before Stan's cigarette is fully returned to Ash. So you're kind of not meant to like him as well, but you also do, he's very much someone you love to hate, I think, and hate to love. So these serial killers, and I think it's safe to say because it's revealed near the start, these, the serial killer, the head honcho, is actually two teenage boys, and their entire goal is to get the record for the most kills and to try and unseat Harold Shipman. Which I thought was I thought was pretty funny actually. It was pretty well handled, and it was interesting how it switched between the head honcho uh, storyline and then this one that follows Stan as well. We have a little bit of necrophilia. Hey, he says to Joel, do you ever fuck the body after it's been frozen? God no, it's solid. Why? Do you with the heads? Sometimes, grins Liam, if they've defrosted a bit. Oh, don't worry, we always use a condom. Isn't that right, Joel? Safety first, agrees Joel. So, you know, it's, it's, it's dark. We have a little mention of dogging in Reading, which I thought was funny because I live near Reading and... Uh, I assume you know what dogging is. We, we've, we are readers, we have been around the block a few times. We know what words like dogging mean. What the head honcho does as well, which is very funny, is that he uh, he leaves like little placards or messages with his victims. So with the doggers, he leaves a sign saying, I blame you for this. And another one saying, oh, shut up. You're the one who wanted to go dogging. So it becomes kind of a thing after you've had the first few victims. You look forward to the next victim so you can read what the sign's going to say. There was a scene in it as well which I think kind of captured Manchester quite well. And it was like a confrontation between like a chav, which for you Americans that theoretically stands for council house and violent. It's basically the British version of a redneck. Uh, between a chav and then like uh, a hipster on the streets of Manchester. And I can see that happening. Stan's also a very lucky little so-and-so as well. There are lots of things like... 
I, I would almost say it's like Deus Ex Machina in that it looks like he's certainly going to die and then something random saves him. Like this one point where he decides to pick up a penny and it saves his life. But that I think calling it Deus Ex Machina is wrong because throughout there's this theme of luck. So he has this rabbit's foot, for example. And um, I think somebody... So he gets rid of it and then somebody sells it back to him and stuff and he's all throughout the book He's trying to get rid of it, but he can't and uh, fortunately for him his luck doesn't change There's a funny moment as well when they're all drinking for Stan's birthday and he's been obviously he's terminal That's kind of the point with this He's been told by his doctor that he's gonna die and that's where these bets start come in He bets that he'll make it to his next birthday, but on his birthday and he's not having a good time and someone goes, ah, oh, well, at least there's next year. And it's like, oops, no, there isn't. There's also, what I noticed in here, there's a reference to uh, a subway where it says question everything. And beneath that, it says why. And I noted that down at the time because I've seen a picture of that subway. But it's actually here as well at the end of the book. I don't know if you can see that. That's the author in front of that graffiti wall as well, which I thought was quite cool. Obviously it gets darker and darker. At one point the head honcho serial killers are talking to each other and they're like, Oh, should we kill a kid next? Yeah, so the, the, the head honcho gets to 62, but Shipman's up to about 260, so they've got a long way to catch up with him. It's a very British sense of humour, I would think, and almost very northern sense of humour. I think you'd enjoy this more if you were if you were from Manchester or even up from like Sheffield, Leeds or you know, Liverpool, somewhere like that. Even Scottish, you know, I think you'll enjoy it more than if you're a Londoner, but I'm from the Midlands, so I get the best of both worlds. One great bet that Dougie makes, he basically just has to get kicked in the balls every day. <laughs> and so this becomes like an ongoing thing, and every now and then in the manuscript, it, you get to another page, and, and Dougie's getting kicked in the balls again. Another guy makes a bet that he can't leave his house all year as well. And these bets throughout are really quite funny. There is one pit that might be a spelling mistake, I don't know, it's the word clunge. And Baldwin spells it with a K, and I would personally spell it with a C. There's a little footnote, and I think this was a great use of footnotes. I mean, obviously, Terry Pratchett's quite well, well known for them, and he himself is a comedic author. And I guess he pioneered the style of using footnotes to add a joke or to add a punchline, you know. So at this point, there's a point where they go to visit Man Mandy's Megastars, which is obviously a house of ill repute. And the footnote says, As Mandy's Megastars is entirely fictional, imaginary, and made up, in no way did the author receive payment of any kind from Mandy, who also doesn't exist. Nor did he enjoy free massages or other optional extra services from any of the fictitious girls whilst performing his extensive research. Glad we cleared that up. There's also something that I kind of found funny when they're, they're at the uh, brothel, and... Um, the, basically, the madam is talking about how the, the recession isn't affecting her. She says, uh, oh, let me just read this paragraph out. And no, advises the receptionist stiffly, none of the girls would be up for providing any kind of service on credit. Nope, not even a quick hand job. What recession? Believe it or not, the parlour is busier, if anything. All right, here we go. Now we've got a great bit. This is probably Dougie the Scotsman in one paragraph. I was hoping for some rimmin, confides Dougie, matter-of-factly. No need to be shy with working girls, they've heard it all before and then some. Been a long time since I've enjoyed that particular pleasure, he grins. It's nah the pretty pink starfish it once was mind, marry a battered and bumpy old sheriff's badge, but... That was me doing a Scottish accent. You are welcome. Not Scottish at all. I, can't, I can only do my own accent. I can maybe do a Brummy accent. Some of this though is quite touching as well, it's not all just sweary whatevers. So for example, Christ, this was just how it went with his dad. Forgetting every little thing like putting on trousers and who he was. Accusing Colin of selling his old army medals. Which was actually true, but his dad didn't know that. Not for sure, nothing he could prove anyway. And hoovering the front lawn at midnight. Then he had to sell dad's house to cover the care home fees. Years of care home fees. By the time the old man croaked, there was barely enough left in the pot to pay for a home cinema system and a fortnight in LA with spending money. And that was it. Spent. Over. After all the waiting. Colin's still pissed about it. The head honcho kills somebody and leaves them on a train and the sign he leaves with them says do not wake so they don't actually realise the guy's dead. And we got this, so this is where the police are talking about this head that's just been found in the train station. To remind you of just how sick and depraved our killer is, chides the super sternly, Mr Heath's head was wearing headphones and listening to talking heads. There's a karaoke scene and what I quite liked about the karaoke scene is uh, beat it, just beat it, nobody wants to be defeated, sings Stan. He isn't hot on the King of Pops lyrics. And I think we've all been at a situation in which we've been doing karaoke and realised we don't know the song whatsoever. There are also lots of references to pickled eggs, and I really like pickled eggs. There's a bit where they're talking about how Stan surely has to die at some point, and someone goes, he has to die sometime, he's not Captain Scarlet. Which is great. I used to like Captain Scarlet. 
This is the voice of the Mr. Ons. They have a cheese rolling scene, which again is another delightfully British thing. If you've not heard of cheese rolling, just Google it. And in fact, look on YouTube, there are probably some videos. The idea is a giant ball of cheese rolls down a hill and everybody runs after it. And somehow people don't die. And that's one of many schemes that Maggie, the bookmaker, came up with to try and kill Stan so that he couldn't, you know, redeem his bet. There's some interesting things. I think it's with Dougie where he's wearing, what is it that he's wearing? He's wearing a superhero costume. I think it's a Wonder Woman costume. And uh, then he ends up getting into like, say the cheese rolling and he still has to do it in his Wonder Woman costume because if he takes the Wonder Woman costume off, he loses that bet. Then we found me, are we ready? So uh, a guy, I'm gonna tell you about this, this is a spoiler, but they find a body uh, without his head in a Postman Pat kiddie ride. And it says here, the DS was ready for this. Dane Cobain, he recites from memory, book blogger, poet, and wannabe novelist from High Wycombe, age 19. Weight 175 pounds, height six foot four. Six foot four? How the f did he squeeze him in there? Well, he's got no head, gov. Well, my sign, the sign around my torso said, "I think I hit something," and it was my head that was beneath the ride. Kind of surreal to read about yourself being decapitated and leaving a kiddie's ride. Another great Dougie quote here: "Listen to me, God," bellows the man a third of the way up the tower. "If there is an afterlife, you better have filled it with hookers and booze." I've stopped trying to do the Scottish accent now, it's too hard. So like I say, I mentioned all the way throughout, I was kind of feeling this is a bit like an Irvin Welsh book. It has that feel, partly just because of the Scottish dialogue. But there is actually a reference as well. It says, uh, if you thought the feculent bog faced by Renton in train spotting was horrendous, it's got nothing on this place. And delightful, they are talking about toilets. I'm just gonna read you this, this short little excerpt. The last line of this just cracked me up when I was reading it. Sorry, can I just, did you say the killer had sex with every head? and now he's having sex with the torsos too. The detective nods. Yes, in the more recent murders, the torsos as well. Another change in MO, shouts Brittany Snook. Signature, mutters Alan. Anally or vaginally, asks Mark Godfrey, private eye. Sometimes both, expounds Alan. But only anally with the male torsos, clarifies Sanders. That's what got me, <laughs> I just wasn't expecting. I like that there's a pub called the Highland Cow as well. He was trying to figure out where to... Oh, actually, I can't say that. That is a big spoiler, so I'm not going to say that. It's Somebody dies, unfortunately. And then there is a hilarious scene with what then happens to their remains. Hurry, pal, hurry. If that bastard Colin finds me, he'll be using me as fucking cat litter. This is the dead speaking to him. There's a lot of the dead speaking to living characters in this that's just kind of handled as if it's normal. And if you just take it as if it's normal, it works really well. I mean, again, it's a dark comedy. It's not meant to be like literary fiction or anything like that. Stan's trying to obviously make it to his birthday to, to cash in on this bet. And there's a fly and he's trying to catch this fly and he's getting really annoyed and he's like, uh, what does it say here? If it's the last thing I do, Figgis, I will kill you. I refuse to be outlived by a fly. And yes, he did call the fly Figgis. There's a cafe called Red, the Red Dragon Cafe. And I assume that is a nod to the Hannibal Lecter books because obviously we've got a serial killer here. So if so, that's very nicely done. And basically that's about all I'm gonna tell you about this. Obviously I can't go too much into the plot because I don't want to spoil it, but equally it is. The entire plot is Stanley McLeod and his friend Dougie making these bets with Maggie, the corrupt bookmaker. And then meanwhile, the head honcho is out killing people. That is the plot of this book. That's all you need to know. However, I have still talked about it for 20 minutes just because I can. Sorry, I'm getting messages from clients. Pete, I got just, just a message from a client being like, have you finished my work yet? And I'm like, no, I'm, I'm filming. <laughs> my bad. <laughs> all in all for this, I will give this a four out of five. And this is using the rating scheme that I explained in my last video. Basically, we're using a slightly different rating scheme for indie authors. And for that rating scheme, a 5 out of 5 is basically a book that's so good that it should be mainstream and everyone should read it. And the reason I can't give it to this is because this book shouldn't be mainstream. It's not a mainstream book. You know, it should mainly be, may, maybe be more mainstream and more well known. But it shouldn't, you know, this isn't the next Harry Potter or something like that. It, you know, it's... Uh, it's darker than that and it's only for a certain type of reader so be warned about that however if it does sound like your cup of tea i think you will enjoy it now we have the moment of choice where it's time to decide what we what well okay so now is the moment of choice where it's time to decide what i will be reading in march for tarden danes indie read along so in march i will <laughs> I can't believe I'm still doing that thing. All right, in March, I have a choice of two books, and I do only have one of them here with me. 
So the first one is Trespass by Mikey Campling, and that is um, it's like a, a, a sci-fi novel. Mikey Campling used to be represented by Book Trope, which was the publisher I used to be signed with. They've since gone bust, so you know, bad times. But his book is still out and about, and I still haven't got to it. So option number one is Trespass by Mikey Campling. And option number two is The Road to Saigon by Lucy Cruikshanks. And Lucy Cruikshanks here on YouTube is Lucy from Book Axe. And so you might have watched Lucy and Scott. I definitely recommend checking out their channel, actually. But as well as kind of running Book Axe with Scott. Oh, we're home. The cat's just back from the vets. You're back, Biggie. Hey, mate. You want to come out? Come on, Biggie boy. Boo, 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 boo. No, I've been betrayed. Oh, -ho! good boy. Okay, mate. He's just had his little claws cut. So you might have seen Lucy here on BookTube, as well as being whatever she is at BookAx, I guess co-founder with Scott. She is also a published author, and I actually have basically no knowledge about what her book is about. I do know she did a video recently where she was talking about it. I'm not going to read out what these books are about until we decide which one we're going to get. So... I say which one we're gonna get. I've already ordered them both, but only one has arrived. So we're gonna flip a coin here. This is a 10 pence piece, some classic British currency for you American viewers. And uh, yeah, heads is trespass, tails is the road to Saigon. What's this? You ready? See this at the same time, I guess. Not that this will mean much to you if you don't understand the currency, but it is. You can't see, but it is. Heads, it is the queen. Come on, Queenie. How do we do this? There we go. Fucking Queen. Come on, Queen. I just, I don't think it's meant to be, really, is it? How in the hell would you actually... If I move my head out... It's just very... Anyway, trust me, that is a head. Look, you can see it now. That is the Queen's head. So, what did I say was heads? Heads, I said, was Trespass by Mikey Campling. Which works well, because that is the one that I do happen to have. So there we have it, hot off the press, the March book for Tarden Danes, indie read-along, at least on my part, is going to be Mikey Campling Trespass. So I don't know what Todd's reading yet, but I'm looking forward to finding out. I might even read that along with him. But in the meantime, Trespass is obviously by Mikey, Mikey Campling. It's the Darkening Stone book one. On the front it says, Somewhere, sometime, the stone is waiting. A tale of supernatural suspense. So I'm going to read the blurb quickly to you so you can decide whether this sounds like the kind of thing that you like. And if you want to read this with me in March, then uh, be sure to pick up a copy. Nobody goes into the old quarry. Nobody until today. Three parallel stories spanning 5,000 years, united by one deadly secret. Somewhere, sometime, the stone is waiting. Trespass combines the action of a gripping thriller with a historical mystery set in the ancient past and blends supernatural suspense with time travel. Discovered over 5,000 years ago, the Darkening Stone affects everyone who finds it. Jake was too smart to believe the rumours about Scatterstone Pit, but now he's in more danger than he could ever have imagined. In 1939, as World War II looms, the lives of two men will be changed forever. Over 5,000 years ago, a hermit will keep the stone a secret, but someone is watching him, someone with murder in his heart. But what will happen when these different worlds collide? How will the tales unfold? And when it finds you, what will you see when you look into the Darkening Stone? So yeah, looking forward to it. And both Todd and myself will be posting our reviews of our March indie books on the same day and then, you know, continuing the cycle. I'm not sure what day that is yet, but I'll put that in the description once we've figured it out. So anyway, thanks a lot for watching Tarden Danes Indie Read Along. And uh, be sure to hit that like button. <laughs> I don't know what I'm doing. Be sure to leave a like if you enjoyed this video. Drop me a comment to let me know whether you're going to be picking this up. We're also, you know, we're just happy if anyone reads more indie. So if you want to read an indie book in March and none of the picks that myself and Todd choose catch your fancy, then feel free to choose a book of your own. And in the meantime, please do hit subscribe for more bookish videos. And I'll see you soon for another one. Thanks a lot. Bye.